Well, good morning, everyone. You can join me in opening your Bibles to Leviticus 19, and let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for this morning and Your Word, the truths we were able to sing, the prayers we were able to pray. Thank You for the fellowship of brothers and sisters in this room. And we pray now as we give our attention directly to hearing your word, Leviticus 19, that you would give us clarity of understanding, open our hearts to receive your word, and transform us on the spot so that we all leave here different, more like your son. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So Leviticus 19 this morning, and if you don't have a Bible with you, You can grab one underneath some chairs nearby, and that's on page 97 in those Bibles. So this is the uh, last sermon in Leviticus for a few weeks. Uh, We're going to take a short break for Advent and be in the book of Hebrews, and it'll still be connected to Leviticus, though, because Hebrews shows us that the realities of priesthood and sacrifice and the tabernacle uh, are fulfilled in Jesus. So this morning, we're coming now to one of the most obviously relevant sections in the book of Leviticus. This is where the phrase, love your neighbor as yourself, comes from. So, when Jesus was asked which commandment was the most important of all, He answered with two commands, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So, we're to be lovers of God and lovers of others, and that sums up the law. So, Jesus also told the story of the Good Samaritan, one of the most well-known stories in the Bible, and that was really just an explanation of Leviticus 19, verse 18, love your neighbor as yourself. So, we're looking at one of the central texts in the Bible for understanding ethics and how to live. So, this morning, we're looking at the first 18 verses of the chapter, and then when we come back to Leviticus in several weeks in the new year, we'll look at the second half. The second half actually has some of the more tricky verses that we'll have to work through to understand how this relates to us today, Um, less so in these first 18. Here's the message of the text before we consider it more closely. God's people are to reflect His holy love in all of life. So, this chapter is not just kind of a list of arbitrary or religious rules. This is certainly relevant for all of life, and it gives us a vision for how God leads His people, you and I, to live lives of moral beauty. It gives our church a vision for how to cultivate a gospel culture of love. This is a, this is a vision for every church, what it's supposed to be in whatever culture it finds itself. It's to take its cues from texts like this to have a gospel culture of love and live as lights in the world. So, this was the goal for Israel. When God gave them this chapter, they failed to live it out. They failed to love God and others. Everyone in the world has failed to live this out. But Jesus came to embody, to be the true picture of the holy love of this chapter. So He embodied it in His life. And then in His death, He died for our failures. And then in His resurrection and outpoured spirit, He's now giving new hearts to transform us, to actually pull this off in part. Truly and fully after He returns and in the new creation when it's here in His fullness, but that new creation's broken in already, and He's transforming His people. people. So, this is what we are looking to do and to reflect. So, what would the world look like if every church was marked by what you could call a culture of beauty and love, moral beauty and love? Jesus said, this is how the world would know that you're My disciples, that you love one another. And this is how they'll be convinced the gospel's true. So, let's consider this together. Leviticus 19, the first 18 verses. You can follow along as I read. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves any gods of cast metal. I am the Lord your God. 
When you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord, you shall offer it so that you may be accepted. It shall be eaten in the same day you offer it or on the day after, and anything left over until the third day shall be burned up with fire. If it's eaten at all on the third day, it is tainted. It will not be accepted. And everyone who eats it shall bear his iniquity because he's profaned what is holy to the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from his people. Verse 9, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest, and you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. And you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So this text is showing us that God's people are to reflect His holy love in all of life. There are three key movements in this text. The introduction in the first couple of verses give us the call to holiness. And then verses 3 to 18 give us a series of commands to show us what this looks like in everyday life. And then the climactic command is this last part in verse 18 is to love your neighbor as yourself. Everything's building toward that here. So we'll walk through those three movements and we'll see the beauty of holiness, the relevance of holiness, and the heart of holiness. So first, the beauty of holiness. As always, God does not just dole out commands without giving rationale. He's like a good father. He cultivates trust. So verse 2 is setting the tone for this whole chapter. It says this, speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy For I, the Lord your God, am holy. So God calls Israel to be holy. Now, what does that mean? Well, holiness, I mean, a lot of ideas come to people's mind when they think of holiness. They think of kind of bright light, or they think of something religious, or they think of, you know, a room that they would call a sanctuary that has a presence of awe in it or something like that. But here's what holiness is about. It's about two things. It's about devotion to God and moral beauty. So it's about devotion to God. Holiness means to be set apart or consecrated, and it's to be set apart for a purpose, specifically devoted to God. So in Leviticus, all sorts of things can be holy. Furniture and like spoons can be holy if they're in the tabernacle, right? If they're set apart and devoted to God and for His use and for that purpose, they're holy. Holiness is also about moral beauty. So for Israel to be holy, they have to pursue a quality of life together. They have to pursue a kind of ethical goodness, a moral integrity. We could say a moral beauty. So this is what holiness means. It's being devoted to God and living with moral beauty. That's a very different understanding of holiness than many people have. And why are God's people to live like this? Well, the rationale is given in verse 2. You shall be holy, so you shall be devoted to God and live with moral beauty. Why? For I, the Lord your God, am holy. So we're to be holy because God is holy. How is God holy? Well, think about those two aspects of holiness. They're most deeply true of God. Holiness is devotion to God. That's certainly true of Him. He is distinct and other and set apart, devoted to His own glory above all. 
And holiness is about moral beauty. God is morally beautiful. Now, we don't often use the idea of beauty to refer to God, or ethics for that matter, but we should. So, I'd encourage you to have the the word and language of beauty closely associated to how you think of God and who He is, and ethics, how we're to live. This is how the Bible speaks of God's character, with the combination of love and justice and goodness and patience and so forth. His glory, that, that language is related to beauty. In fact, the prophet Isaiah often refers to God as glorious, radiant, beautiful, We worship Him in the splendor of His holiness. It's referring to His character. So, beauty is not just about kind of the aesthetics we see with our eyes, physical aesthetics, but it's also about moral aesthetics that we perceive with our hearts. So, when we see someone, I mean, think of someone in your life who lives with moral beauty. There's a beauty there even if they're not physically attractive. In fact, people can become, I mean, this happens in marriages. As people get older, they become less attractive in the eyes of the world physically, and yet they can become more beautiful, more attractive, more handsome to their spouse because that spouse sees them growing in character and moral beauty, regardless of what they look like. Jonathan Edwards uh, help me understand this better than any, anyone else. He referred to this pastor of the 1700s in New England. He referred to God's holiness as his infinite beauty. He was converted when he was reading the Bible, and it was God's character that stood out to him as he was reading. And here's how he described what happened to him when he became a Christian. So he had known about God, grown up in a Christian home, studied the Bible, but becoming a Christian isn't just kind of being in a Christian environment, right, and knowing true things about God and believing true facts about Jesus, right? It's a transformation of the heart. God gives us a new heart, and what changes in us? Well, here's how he described what happened when he became a true Christian. He said, God has appeared to me a glorious and lovely being, chiefly on account of His holiness. And he wrote a book that's still important today. I commend it to you called Religious Affections. And by that title, he means true affections or the the deep desires of the heart of a true Christian. And he said, when someone becomes a Christian, they receive a new heart and they receive new desires planted within them. We, We call this the doctrine of regeneration. Jesus referred to this as the new birth. And Edwards drills down into the very essence of what changes inside of us when we become a Christian. So, what's now different in the heart of someone when God brings them to Christ? He says it's this, they love God in the first place for the beauty of His holiness or moral perfection as being supremely amiable in itself. So, a Christian loves God first and foremost for the beauty of His holiness. They see the the radiant splendor of His character, and that itself is attractive to them. So, God's holiness is His moral beauty, the perfection of His goodness and love and truthfulness, faithfulness, patience, and the beautiful, perfect combination of those. And when someone becomes a Christian, they see God's character as beautiful. So, what is God saying here? He's saying, I am the God of infinite beauty, and I have shown that to you in the way that I've loved you and rescued you. He's saying that to Israel. You've seen me display my glory and the beauty of my character in rescuing you from Egypt. So, now I'm calling you to reflect my moral beauty in your life, and that will make you a whole different kind of people on the planet. You'll live with a kind of moral magnetism that will be attractive to other people. Jesus calls us to the same thing today. Jesus came and lived the perfectly beautiful, morally beautiful life. I mean, isn't this why He is so compelling in our world? He is the most influential person who has ever lived in human history. And He has been compelling to people across the ages, through the centuries, 
from nearly every ethnic people group on the planet, they find him compelling because of the beauty of his character. And they've surrendered to him. And they've followed him. They've devoted their lives to him. You all who are following him have done the same. And it's because we've been captivated by the beauty of his holiness. Our culture loves beauty, and it's because we're made in God's image. Beauty matters. I remember uh, Steve Jobs talking about the release of one of the new iPhones or iPads, and, and you watch this five, maybe five, ten minute presentation, and someone counted up all the times he said beautiful, dozens of times. That's what was so compelling, because Apple's done such a fantastic job of tapping into this creational goodness of beauty. Aesthetics matter. Not everyone cares about it, and that's okay, but those of you who do, that's, an, that's a reflection of God because you're made in His image. Beauty matters. However, our culture values beauty only that's skin deep and fleeting. And so our culture is monetizing it. It wants young men and women to market their bodies. It wants those who are aging to invest in countless beauty products and surgeries. And at the same time, our culture thinks that the deeper beauty, moral beauty, is insignificant. It thinks holiness is boring. But real moral beauty is compelling. C.S. Lewis put it this way in one of his letters. How little people know who think holiness is dull. When one meets the real thing, it is irresistible. Obviously, people have met fake versions of it and it's rightly repulsive, filled with hypocrisy. But there is a such thing as real moral beauty and holiness in the world, created by God and His Holy Spirit. And when you meet the real thing, it's irresistible. This is what God wants us to pursue. This is for those who are from the youngest ages in elementary, middle, high school, through those who are aging and don't have as much time left. This means that true beauty is accessible to you. Don't put your energy in, and your identity in fleeting physical beauty. Get to know God. Enjoy being loved by Him. Learn to reflect His holy love. Okay, so what does this look like then? How is this vision relevant for our everyday lives? What's it going to look like for you at 2.33 this afternoon? Because it is going to look like something. It can look like something. Every minute of every day. No matter what you're doing, there's an opportunity to reflect moral beauty. So what does it look like? Well, second, the relevance of holiness. The rest of our text here is a series of commands, and it shows holiness in action. And before we look at the details here, we can actually learn something about holiness by just taking in the whole and making an observation about everything here. The organization of this text has a sense of intentional randomness to it. So there's clusters that be, belong together. So you'll get, you know, anywhere from one to four or so commands, and then God says, I am the Lord, or I am the Lord your God. So they're clustered together, and it makes sense why they're clustered together, but from one cluster to another, it's weaving out, in and out of every aspect of life, seemingly at a random organizational structure. So they relate to how we use our time, and then how we relate to family, then how we treat neighbors then how we pursue justice, how we use our resources at work, how we pay employees, how we treat vulnerable people. It covers personal time, home life, community life, vocational life. All of these categories are merged together and overlapping without any sense that there's a priority from one to the next or, or an ordered priority. So do you see what that teaches us about holiness? It teaches us that it relates to every aspect of life. You don't just pick one part of life and say, that's the part of life where I'm to be holy, and this part of life doesn't matter. No, every moment, every sphere of life, every relationship you have, holiness is not with moral beauty. And this is wonderful because this means that no matter how, how insignificant you feel, no matter how insignificant your sphere of life and influence feels right now, it's an opportunity to reflect real holiness and moral beauty. 
It also shows us then that holiness is not just for a few select people. It's not just for super Christians. It's not for super saints. It's for ordinary people. So let's walk through these commands and we'll see as we go eight marks of holiness. So first, holiness is marked by honor. Verse 3, every one of you shall revere his mother and his father. So this is essentially the fifth of the Ten Commandments. The commandments are kind of worked through this chapter in random order. In the Ten Commandments, it says to honor father and mother. Here it says to revere them. And notice that the mother's listed first and then the father. That's probably significant. It makes it clear that mothers and fathers are both equally important as parents and should be revered, both of them. And the command to revere parents applies not just to the younger people in the room who still live in a home with parents, but also adult children who have aging parents still alive. This remains relevant in all of life. American youth culture tends to underappreciate age and wisdom and parents, and God says there's something morally beautiful about honoring parents. Second, holiness is marked by rest. Now, I wouldn't have expected that. Verse 3 says, you shall keep my Sabbaths. So, God set apart the seventh day as a day of rest for Israel. It was a day to acknowledge God and trust Him as their provider. So God had built the rhythm of work and rest into their life together, and it's built into the fabric of creation. There have actually been two societies, as far as I've been able to learn, that try to have a 10-day work week. It's tried to do something more uh, than this seven-day in kind of an extreme way, and it was during the French and Russian revolutions, and they both failed. It didn't end up working out because people couldn't function working that many days straight on end, repeatedly. So a society where everyone works all the time won't end up working well. We need to slow down and rest and find renewal. Some of you are really good at this. Some of you are too good at that, and you need to work harder. Some of you are really, really bad at this, and you do not even know how to rest. I mean, I've heard so many times, and I've been like this as well, where even if I was to have a stretch of time to rest is kind of like, I wouldn't even know what to do with it, so I'm not even going to try. But we need to try. It's important. And again, our culture is marked more by busyness than rest and renewal, and it's not working out for us. And most deeply, Jesus invited us to find true rest for our souls in Him. All our restlessness in life, our frantic, crazy busy lives, are sometimes a symptom of a deeper restlessness of our souls. And as our souls then rest in Christ, we can slow down and build rhythms of rest into our lives because we're not having to build our identity through what we do incessantly. We have it in Jesus, and we can rest because He says it's good for us. And that leads to the third mark of holiness, which is worship. Verse 4, do not turn to idols or make for yourselves any gods of cast metal. I am the Lord your God. So Israel made these little statues of false gods as a way of focusing their worship, Today, we don't make statues, but idolatry is still here. The human heart's always finding ways to set itself on something else in the place of God. So, idolatry is what happens when we take something, even a good thing, and make it an ultimate thing in our hearts. The deeper idols are often money or power and control or success or comfort But none of those things will fulfill us when we have them, if we're setting our whole heart on them. So holiness orders the heart to trust and love and worship God above everything else. Fourth mark is generosity. Verses 5 through 10 are grouped together, and the commonality is hoarding. So verses 5 to 8, God says that when Israel, an Israelite was to give a peace offering, they had to eat it within a couple days. And there was a serious consequence. If you don't do this, if you're eating on the third day or after that, you're cut off from your people. Like, why is that such a big deal? Well, here's what the peace offering was. This was the offering, we call it a fellowship offering as well, that was a communal feast with God. So the best part of the animals offered to God on the altar Part of the animal is given to the priest, and then the rest of it is to be eaten that day or the next day because you're to invite friends and family to have a party, to have a feast in God's presence before the tabernacle, and you enjoy that in a couple days. So, 
Why do they do that? It's because this was not to be used as a way of hoarding food. You don't offer it to God and then pack it up in Tupperware and then take it home with you so that you can kind of put it in your lunch for the next three weeks, for just for yourself. This was to be a feast celebrating God and peace with God and one another. So the offer needed to invite friends and family, no leftovers, have it all, have a party, enjoy it, no hoarding, be generous. That was the point of it. And then the next verse continues the theme. Verse 9 says, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. So if you have a field and it's time to gather for the harvest, God says, that's great, don't gather the edges. You leave the edges. And then when you glean, don't pick up every little bit that drops to the ground. Leave it. He says the same with the vineyard. Don't pick up every last grape that falls. Don't, take, don't strip your vineyard bare. Why? For the sojourner and the poor, so that they can come into your field or your vineyard and eat and collect. So, verse 10 says that they're to leave it for the poor and the sojourner. This was one of the ways that Israel was to care generously for those who were vulnerable in their land. The women of our church are studying Ruth in the women's Bible study. So you've seen this principle worked out with Boaz and Ruth, right? Ruth was an impoverished foreigner. Boaz was a wealthy landowner. And he honored this law. And so he invited Ruth to glean and follow the other women uh, to follow his workers to gather from his fields. And then he even went above and beyond this principle by sending her home with food. So how can we apply this principle today? Most of us don't have fields or vineyards, so is this totally irrelevant? And even if you did have a field and vineyard, would poor and vulnerable people in our culture be kind of waiting at the edges to glean from what you have? Are you supposed to kind of leave some of your garden in your backyard for people that don't have anything to come and take from that? Well, here's how you can apply this principle. You can build extra into your budget to give generously to people in need. Either whenever that need presents itself to you or you go out of your way to find people who are in need. You can engage with some of our partner ministries that serve the poor or other friends and members who are engaged in various ways to care for the poor. You can give to the church. Some of our resources are given to helping those in need. So this whole thing is also just against a penny-pinching and hoarding mindset. Some of you struggle with this. Some of you are frugal, but it's not for the sake of generosity. It's for the sake of storing up for yourself savings just for yourself, and you don't even have a clear plan of what you would do with it. Saving is good, and being frugal can be very good and wise, but a penny-pinching and hoarding mindset is not healthy if it's focused on yourself and selfishly. Now, I know some people who are very frugal, and the whole reason why they're so devoted to saving money is so that they can be lavish in their generosity to the others. Um, what, a, what a beautiful way to live. This section is also relevant for policies. I mean, this was a kind of welfare system. Notice that it also allows for the poor to keep their dignity by working. They don't just get a handout. They're invited to gather. That's a wise principle because it helps them not just material, materially, but also emotionally and socially and psychologically. This is a holistic approach to caring for people in need. So when you think about policies for our community and our state and our nation, you can apply this principle. This was a holistic approach that maintained the dignity of those who were being helped. So one of the key markers of happiness, and there's been so many studies that have shown this, in study after study after study, what makes people happy? It's faith, family, friendship, and meaningful work. People need meaningful work to be fulfilled and happy. So the poor should be helped, and they should also be honored by giving them meaningful work, helping them find meaningful work, or at least not incentivizing them to not work in order to get the help. So this is a principle behind wise policies and nonprofits and organizations that care for the poor. 
A fifth mark is integrity. Verses 11 to 12 address stealing, lying, swearing by God's name. These are drawing on a few of the Ten Commandments. This is calling us to live with integrity, to speak truth to people, not to steal from them. Sixth, compassion. This is about not oppressing or exploiting the weak. So verse 13 says, you shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. And the wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. So the topic of oppression is obviously uh, centrally important to us as a culture right now. Oppression is rightly rejected and condemned and victims are rightly supported and cared for. We're waking up to ways that people in power have oppressed those who were vulnerable There's been oppression in the home and in relationships and in workplaces that's rightly being exposed. At the same time, we also need to recognize that our culture is doing a pendulum swing right now. They've picked this as the issue of our time, and many, therefore, will uphold this value while neglecting other values that also need to be held at the same time. So we saw this when riots are not condemned or Hamas is not condemned because they can claim a victim status as being oppressed and therefore what they do isn't morally repulsive. We need to listen to and honor and take seriously claims of oppression. We also know that sometimes people use a victim status as a weapon against someone else. And so this chapter gives us principles and values to hold them both together as we seek true justice. Verse 14 then continues the mark of compassion. It's against bullying the disabled. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear your God. I am the Lord. So think about what's going on here. If you curse a deaf person, that's not just kind of making fun of them. The deaf person can't hear your curse, right? So it's public, public mockery at their expense. If you put a stumbling block in front of a blind person, that's not just like tripping someone. That's putting that in front of someone that can't see it. So this is publicly humiliating and taking advantage of their disability for a a laugh. So this is about bullying and embarrassing people, especially those here with disabilities. So God esteems those who have weakness, vulnerabilities, disabilities, and so should we. We should honor and help those with disabilities. We want to be a church that treats the disabled with dignity and with respect. A church culture should be a place of honor and care, and I'm so grateful for so many of you that do this so well. Seventh, justice. Verses 15 and 16 speak of doing no injustice in the court. And listen to this balanced approach. Once again, It's holding up two things that our culture often doesn't hold together or in our hearts we don't hold together. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. So that's the right balance we need. If someone is rich and powerful, they don't get special treatment. And if someone's poor and vulnerable, they don't get special privilege just because of that either. There's a reason why Lady Justice is blindfolded. So this is why we don't want activist justices who are pursuing their agenda at the expense of true justice. We want men and women who honor the truth and seek justice. Final mark here is peace. Verses 17 and 18. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, that's very practical. God is seeking here to prevent the poison of bitterness from spreading in this community. If someone has wronged you, when someone wrongs you, rather than being bitter or angry or gossiping or slandered, slandering, you speak truth to them. You talk to them about it. Be reasonable. If they've wronged you, gently correct them. Have a conversation. And this is the climactic command in the first half of the chapter. Everything's building to this point, this command, to love your neighbor as yourself. So this is holiness. Holiness is devotion to God and living with moral beauty. And it's marked by honor 
rest, worship, generosity, integrity, compassion, justice, and peace. Is that what you think of when you think of holiness? Is holiness dull and boring and irrelevant to life? So this leads to the heart of holiness, which is the last point here. The first half of this chapter is building toward that climactic last command in verse 18, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said that the commands to love God and love your neighbor as yourself summarize the law. The Apostle Paul said that if we love, we fulfilled the law. This is not a command, by the way, to love yourself. Our therapeutic age has twisted this, so maybe you've heard that in order to love others, you have to love yourself first, and that's what this is getting at. I mean, okay, there's some truth to that. Uh, Obviously, if you loathe yourself, you're going to be a distraction to yourself to even love other people. But this is not a command to love ourselves. This assumes that we already do. We're always orienting life around ourselves, seeking out how to care for ourselves and advance ourselves. We already do that. And so what this is saying is take that self-interest you already have and direct that to other people. Love other people as you're already so good at loving yourself. Treat others as you want to be treated. So here's the main point. The heart of holiness is love. And this is the heart of God's own moral beauty that we're to reflect. God's holiness, if you want to know where to see it, most clearly it's seen in his love. God's holiness and his love are not at odds. It's not that kind of God has this terrifying holiness over here, but he's also loving. That's actually not how the Bible presents it. It's that he's holy, and one of the ways in which we see his holiness is in his love, because his holiness is his moral beauty. He is so set apart and and superior to us in his love and all of his other attributes. And so the commands here are just different ways of expressing love to others, reflecting God. So you love your parents by honoring them. You love God by worshiping him. You love the poor by not hoarding, but being generous to them. You love your neighbor by not stealing from them or lying to them. You love the disabled by blessing and helping them. You love victims and the accused by seeking justice. And this is the moral beauty that Jesus came to reflect. So when Jesus came, he did not come kind of in search for this happening so that he could say, where are the people pulling this off? Because you're my kind of people and you get in. Right? No, the whole point, the whole reason he came is because we have all failed. Israel didn't do this. The nation certainly weren't doing this. Jesus came to a world that was morally ugly. And he came to demonstrate and be the radiance of the glory of God. And so we've all failed. Every one of us have lived lives that have a mix of beauty and ugliness. We've created a culture that shot through with both beauty and moral ugliness. And because God is just... He will judge the world in righteousness, but he's also a God of holy love, a love far greater than ours, and so he shows grace through Jesus. So Jesus came to embody God's holy love toward sinners. He honored his parents. He worshiped the Father. He cared for the poor with great compassion. He pursued true justice. He showed compassion to the disabled and healed them. And he shows compassion to you and me. Morally ugly sinners. He laid down his life for us so that we could be forgiven and restored. And then when we see the cross, what do we see? We see the beauty of holiness. We see God's love and his justice and his faithfulness and his goodness and his grace shining through this is how we're changed. This is why Jesus has been so compelling through human history. This is why the cross has been such a compelling image representing him in human history because it shows his love as he dies for sinners. And then this is what leads us to reflect his holy love in all of life. So we gladly obey the command then. As we behold his beauty, we receive his love and grace. This then is what leads us to gladly obey the command, be holy for I am holy. 
That's not like be weird because I'm weird. Like that's what people think when they think holiness. It's everything we've seen here. So if you're not a Christian yet, God is not calling you first to start obeying the principles of this chapter. He's first calling you to see that this is ultimately an expression of himself and his own character. And Jesus has shown this as the most morally beautiful and compelling person in human history. And then he's calling you and all of us to see that we've failed to live this way. The law shows the beauty of God, and it also reveals our sin. So we see how we failed to live this out. But Jesus isn't just the perfect display of this love. This shows his love and grace at the cross. And so receive his death for you, that he died to show God's holy love and give you grace and forgiveness. So trust him. Ask him to forgive your sins. Receive his love. And then continue to get to know him. See him. Behold his glory. Get to know the moral beauty and radiance of God through Jesus. And then learn from him to become like him. And then we live this out in every bit of life. There's not a part, there's not one minute. I I encourage you this week to try to find one minute of your life, one aspect of your life that this is not relevant to. Let me know if you can find one. And I'll do my best to show you that you're wrong. (laughs) So the goal for this is to mark our church out as a place of beauty in a very confused world and morally ugly world that we've all participated in. The goal is to keep loving Jesus, keep him at the center, the radiant, beautiful center, and then let the centrality of the triune God and his holy love radiate through our lives as we receive His grace and by His Spirit reflect Him. And then we want to invite people into our lives and into our church community to experience the love of God and see it. We want to plant churches that reflect this holiness in our world. We want to send missionaries out to plant more churches around the world to embody this holy love. Because this is why God made the world, isn't it? The God of infinite beauty has made the world to reflect His beauty, to put His beauty and glory on display. And you and I get to be caught up in this, even though we have been the opposite. We get to be caught up in this plan to reflect God's beauty now and forever. What a privilege. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your omni-relevant word. We thank you for, and we praise you for being beautiful, infinitely beautiful in holiness, in your love, in your justice, the way that you show us how good you are, in your faithfulness, your unswerving righteousness. Thank you and we praise you. We also thank you for coming to us in Christ to display that holy love to win us back. And so we pray that your spirit would be working in our hearts to keep our, the eyes of our heart open to behold your beauty and to reflect that to one another. We pray also that as a result of this, you'd bring many people to yourself. Pray this in Jesus' name.